Look who's, who's all excited now. Yeah. Let's see what this is. It's a greenie. Oh, it's a greenie. Can you get down? Get down. Get down. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, Lily's back. Lily was at uh, Doggy Spa all day and got her hair done. And I think, I think perfume too. I think yeah, a lot of stuff going on there. And I had planned to do something different, but I have to address what's going on uh, in the news. And I got a couple of weird uh, comments so, from, from you all. <laughs> so first of all, uh, the Washington Post uh, reported that the FDA plans to present data that they claim links COVID vaccine to 25 deaths in children. Uh, and it's basing their claim on the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, uh, which is maintained, it's a public database maintained by the FDA and, uh, and CDC. But in the Post article, they said they're misusing the data. So I, I, this is going to get it in the news, and so I thought it would be really important for you all to be armed with information. Uh, so just so you understand, uh, there's a lot of oversight to these to vaccines and vaccine production. And, Kennedy has pledged that he will personally review all the safety data and improvement on it, so for adverse events, which implies that, there is, that, that there's a need for that because there, there's a problem with somehow the, what, what, the way it's being done now. And I, I just want to tell you that. And the other thing is, you know, that's going to meet in a couple of weeks to decide what the vaccine recommendations are. The FDA has already uh, recommended that, as yes, I mentioned before, that only people over 65 get vaccinated, not people under 65 unless they have a, a high predisposition, not pregnant people, not kids. Okay. So this, this, there's a really a very uh, strong reporting for adverse effects. The VAERS is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System that started in 1990. It's a nationwide uh, spontaneous reporting system uh, manufacturers and physicians are obligated to put data into this, but anyone can call. Uh, my sister can call. Uh, she, she heard somebody got vaccinated and, and had a stroke. My sister can call and, and say that. So it's filled with a bunch of uh, stuff that isn't necessarily causal. It's just people are reporting potential adverse events. There's also the vaccine safety data line, which is 13 integrated health systems that cover about 15 million people. There is also the clinical immunization safety assessment projects, which are eight medical research teams that are of all vaccine experts that are reviewing safety. And with the onset of COVID, uh, they started th this thing called vSafe, which is a web-based self-reported active uh, monitoring system. I, I remember being contacted when I got vaccinated, and I dutifully filled in uh, my daily uh, response to the vaccine. And all these work together to try and identify signals. So the important part is that uh, you are trying to pick up any kind of safety event. Now, back in the old days, we'd have these things called phase four trials. After they're approved, in phase four, we would follow people with a drug or a vaccine and then have a very definitive group of people that we were following, maybe a, you know, a few 10,000, 15,000, not millions. This system really is intended to find all the complaints and then to assess them. So you want to signal and then they go assess whether or not they were related to the vaccine. A report in this particular system, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, does not mean it's causal. So if they're using that to say it's here are 25 deaths without actually showing that they're related to the vaccine. It's not right. Now, so let's look at what, how, what we have seen. So in terms of safety monitoring for, this, for the vaccines for COVID, there have been 1 billion B, 1 billion vaccine doses distributed. There have been 17 safety work groups. There have been 28 advisory meetings by experts in the field. There have been 29 uh, MMWRs, which is the uh, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report that comes out of the CDC, articles by scientists who are reporting this. 114 published manuscripts and 9.6 million people enrolled in Be Safe. So there has never been more people looking at safety. And there were eight signals that jumped up. Death was not one of the signals that jumped up, but there are eight signals. 
Uh, so we, we were, they were reported by a few people, acute myocardial infarction in, in people over the age of 18, venous thromboembolism over the age of 12, immune thrombocytopenia purpura, the platelet disorder in people over 65, strokes in people over 50, seizures, Guillain-Barre, Bell's palsy, and myocarditis. All of those were followed up. So these are the signals we come in. Someone says it might, you know, I got a vaccine and, or my neighbor got a vaccine and he had a stroke. That goes in and so they, these are things, that are signals that are then explored. All were found to not be related to the vaccine except for the myocarditis. That is one of the complications of the vaccine. It's rare, but it's a complication. So, very interesting. This was the incidence of myocarditis within seven days of vaccination per million people, per million. So, and the, the very first vaccine, if you'll recall, was, dead, it was directed to the spike protein of the very first isolate that came from Wuhan, China. That vaccine, dose one, had six per million, 38 per million after the second dose, and that was in 2020, 2021. When it switched over to the bivalent in 2022, it was the Wuhan original one and Omicron BA1, and I've showed you that before. That had a much lower myocarditis incident, and, si and the most recent one tw started in 2023 was the XBB version. That's still very low, two to five per million. In 2023 to 2024 season, they found 30 cases age six to 64, five between 12 and 24, and the CDC, they followed up on all these patients. Uh, so 83% were found to have recovered within 90 days. Over 90% were found to uh, be recovered within a year. Among the patients that had a, a year follow-up, some of rare individual ha had what's called a, an abnormal gadolinium scan. And what that does is that accumulates in, in areas that are scarred. And so that, their thought was maybe there was some scarring there. There were no, no deaths, no cardiac transplants. So it's a rare event, but it happens. And now, the, the interesting thing is uh, COVID itself causes myocarditis. So you can understand. So COVID, the spike protein of COVID, must have something that induces an immune response that is similar to what, what's in the heart. And so you get this inflammatory response, myocarditis, in the heart. Not surprisingly, if you have a vaccine that is the same protein that's generating immune response, you might see that as a complication. So let's talk about the, the problems of getting COVID. So th th those are the complications of the, of the vaccine. So the, pro the trouble is that uh, in patients, kids have a particular uh, problems with managing COVID. So their long COVID is a real problem, well known in, in kids. Uh, there was a study of 129 pediatric patients studied in Italy, 52% of them had at least one recurring symptom even after 120 days. And 42% had uh, inhibition of activities due to headache, joint, muscle pain, respiratory problems. If you recall, there was that multi-system inflammatory disease that was reported in by a couple of New York physicians, 102 cases. Uh, three pediatric deaths. So long COVID, this multi-inflammatory disease, there have been French studies showing cardiovascular complications, a study in the United Kingdom showing renal disease complications, neurologic disease, sepsis and respiratory failure. So COVID is a bad disease for kids. The vaccine the data looks like, yes, there's a low risk of myocarditis, nothing else that, that, that um, came out. So. I do think if the scaring people into thinking that it's really bad, it's causing deaths in children is not a wise move. Now, I also have a couple people mention to me, well, you know, COVID was bad. They're already forgotten how bad it was. COVID was bad, but most people died of their diseases, not of COVID. They died with COVID, not because of COVID. People have said that to me. So I want to show you the data for that. So the, the, the way you really look at the, the impact of diseases like flu or COVID is you look at excess mortality. So we know, following people for years, this is dating back to all the 1980, you can see the mortality is, it, it rises slightly as the population age. Each year, the high, there's slightly higher mortality. But look what happened in the United States. That was in 2019 and 2020. Those are all excess deaths. That's not dying with COVID, that's dying because of COVID. And the sad part of this is you notice when the vaccine was introduced, it didn't go down. And that was because 
half of the deaths attributed to COVID occurred after the vaccine was available. Now, what other country didn't do well? USSR, I'm sorry, it was Russia. So you can see Russia very similar. This other big bump in the uh, excess mortality in, the so in Russia was because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, where there was high incidence of alcoholism and, and adult deaths. Now, look at two other countries. Italy had really was one of the early European countries. Big excess mortality. The next year it was less. They implemented vaccines. Sweden, if you recall, Sweden was the country who said, I'll let everybody get it. It'll be fine. So they stayed open. Big increase in mortality in the first year, and then it dropped probably because the people who got it uh, were now Im immune, had some immunity to it. So if you look at excess mortality over the years, though, it's really interested. Uh, over three years, Russia was 18 percent, Sweden was 18 percent. So Sweden's method of just let everybody get infected led to 18 percent increase in excess mortality. So that wasn't a good strategy either. The USA is only 6 percent, but 6 percent of 300 million plus is a lot of people that didn't need to die. And if you look at the cumulative deaths during that period of time, only, only Russia was slightly worse than the United States, whereas Italy was better. Sweden looks like it's low because it's just the total, total population, but they had the highest percentage. So the reason I'm mentioning all this is COVID is coming back, right? It's going to be, it's, it's beginning to surge again. I mentioned that last week. It's continuing to surge. Increase in positivity, 10.8% in the surveillance data, 1.5% increase in the uh, uh, emergency room visits. And now we're beginning to see hospitalizations go up and even deaths. So this is a time we should be really focusing on getting people vaccinated now. COVID wastewater data, very, very high in the United States, almost back, almost back to the peak levels in, in 2024. And I've mentioned this the last couple of weeks, XFG is the, is the um, strain, is the variant that is dominating. Just to give you some idea of what's, uh, what's out there in, in the vaccine, I've shown this before, uh, but it's really important to look at based on uh, the vaccine uh, for this fall. So if you look at the, the Moderna vaccine in 2023 and Pfizer were to XBB 1.16 there, uh, the newest vaccine that should be out now is up to LP 8.1. That is the fall vaccine. The good news is that it is actually more closely related to XFG than XBB. So the newer vaccine should be a better match. It's not a perfect match, but it should be a better match. And, and it has been very effective at preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and death. So I encourage everyone to get their COVID vaccine. And Texas has got a really high wastewater data. All the dark blue circles are where it's very high, and it's in all these counties. I'm not even going to mispronounce any of them, because none of the hard ones are, are there. Bear County, I'm not even going to mention Bear County because I mispronounced it last time. But Harris County, very high. Dallas, all these areas are very, very high. So again, I, did, I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about it. But this is important. I, I think it, it shows that the, the safety data are really compelling. There's a ton of oversight. I don't see how Kennedy's looking at it individually will make a difference when we have all these experts. Uh, there's no evidence that ties any signal except for myocarditis, not surprisingly, since COVID itself caused myocarditis, and all of those cases resolved. So, I mean, it is one of the most, it's one of the victories and it triumphs of the first uh, Trump administration was the rapid development of the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, which now they're stopping doing. I don't, I don't get it. Anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, Common Spirit, our partner, in the adult uh, hospital uh, program, uh, announced the recipients of their 2025 Clinical Excellence Vision Awards, and three of our physicians uh, uh, received these awards. Dr. Christina Wang, Professor of Ophthalmology, uh, received both an Academic Excellence in Health Equity Research and an Academic Excellence in Practice Innovation Award. Dr. Nicole Provenza, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, received an award in Academic Excellence in Clinical Research. And Dr. Syed Mohammed Sadadage, a cardiology fellow in medicine who received an award in academic excellence in clinical research. And if I pronounced your name wrong, I apologize. Sorry. 
Also, the Simons Foundation announced the nine recipients of the 2025 Class of Fellows to Faculty, supported through the Simons Foundation on Autism Research. Congratulations to Cheryl Brandenburg, a postdoctoral associate in the lab of uh, Roy Silito, a professor of pathology and neuroscience, is one of the, f of the new fellows. This award helps senior postdoctoral research uh, study uh, uh, autism and neuroscience, so that's a really important award. And this week was National Postdoc Appreciation Week. A big shout out to all of our postdoctoral trainees for the many contributions they make in our basic and clinical research programs. We couldn't run labs without postdocs. And my thanks to everyone who gave on Give Big Day. Uh, the, we raised over $400,000 to support programs in the college, and I appreciate everyone's support and encouraging all of your friends uh, to give and all of your generosity. Really appreciate it. And of course, Rosh Hashanah begins next week. And for all of those uh, celebrating Rosh Hashanah, I wish you a happy and healthy new year. Shana Tova. And I can't wait to see you 